Good afternoon and welcome to Politico Live. My name is Aitor Hernandez Morales and I'm a reporter on Politico Europe's energy and climate team where I cover renewable energy, the phase out of coal and southern European affairs. I'd like to welcome you all on a very exciting, for a very exciting panel discussion we'll be holding today on the topic of wind power. Specifically, we've gathered a group of expert panelists to discuss whether offshore wind is that silver bullet solution to the EU's energy challenges. Our chat today is sponsored by a partner, Polska Grupa Ener Energetinska, uh, PGE, who we'd like to thank for making this virtual event possible. And we'd also like to thank, thank all of you. Uh, viewers can now follow us on four different platforms. Uh, you can watch this event through our event website, on Twitter, Facebook, and last but not least, on LinkedIn. While you do, feel free to get involved. You can participate by tweeting about it, at political events, and ask questions via Slido using the hashtag EUWindEnergy. Uh, and that's applicable on both platforms. If you are following from the event website, Slido is embedded below the live stream window. Uh, so if you're following with us on Facebook or Twitter, just use the Slido app on your computer or phone and use the hashtag EUWindEnergy to ask your questions. Uh, just so you can see, if you slide into Slido now, you should be able to see this poll, which is presented by PGE. Uh, and the question uh, before us today is, uh, what is needed to boost the EU's offshore wind sector and meet the Blocks 2050 targets? And the uh, potential uh, responses to that uh, question are cooperation between sectors operating in maritime areas to find mutual synergies, boosting EU supply chain for offshore wind technologies and R&D framework, and providing stimulus for all types of offshore wind events. And now, before we get started, uh, here's a word from Wojciech Dabrowski, president of the management board at Polska Grupa Energetinska. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, offshore wind uh, uh, energy definitely uh, has its momentum. Uh, the European Commission has put in place clearly ambitious offshore renewable energy strategy. Uh, member states uh, are uh, eager to deploy offshore wind technology to provide for a source of renewable and sustainable energy. According to the new Polish energy policy by 2030, approximately uh, 5.9 gigawatts of offshore wind capacities will be commissioned in the Polish exclusive economic zone of the Baltic Sea. By 2040, the total installed capacity will amount to 11 gigawatts. What is worth mentioning, not only companies developing offshore wind farms will benefit, but also domestic industry. For example, according to available external analysis, commissioning of uh, six gigawatts of new capacities will contribute to the creation uh, of uh, up to 77,000 jobs. This issue is of utmost importance in the post-COVID recovery. Polish Wind Energy Association identified it over 100 Polish companies that can be successfully involved in preparation, construction and uh, operation of offshore wind farms. These are ports, marinas, shipbuilding industry and manufacturers of cables and power equi equipment. Currently, we also observe a very a favorable approach of financial institutions to offshore wind projects. We see, uh, we see their great uh, willingness uh, to get involved in it, which in the long run will contribute uh, to the energy transition in Poland. In our opinion, the rule of offshore wind energy, although highlighted in the currently consulted draft of the national recovery plan requires uh, further emphasis with more funds allocated proportionally to the scale of investments. 
Offshore wind energy is one of the pillars of the PGE's new strategy. By 2030, we want to commission uh, 2.5 gigabytes of new offshore capacities and additional one gigabyte after 2030. Our three most advanced uh, offshore wind projects will be able to supply with green electricity about 5.5 million households and reduce carbon dioxide emissions by 11 million annually. That is why we highly welcome the first comprehensive legislative offshore framework in Poland which became effective in mid-February this year. The new policy will enable our investments to soon become, become a, 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 a reality. Recently, we received the approval for a concentration for PGE and Orsted issued by the Polish Office of Competition and Consumer Protection. It gives us the green light for establishing a joint ventures dedicated to commissioning our first uh, 2.5 gigabytes offshore capacities. We hope uh, that with uh, jointly established terms of cooperation, uh, we will make the most uh, of our uh, strengths uh, and knowledge uh, to contribute uh, to ambitious objectives uh, of offshore development reflected in the EU offshore renewable energy strategy. In its strategy, the European Commission assumes uh, that the future model of offshore wind farms will be based on uh, hybrid projects in future, they can be complementary enables, enablers for unlock and looking uh, offshore potential only where they are making they are making sense. Yet we believe, uh, since the majority of projects will stay based on radial grid connection, that EU uh, regulations should not leave behind traditional projects being the most advanced ones. In our view, for example, when uh, discussing uh, possible market arrangements, capacities connected to only one binding zone should be a part of the binding zone, especially if they didn't intend to become hybrid assets once they were commissioned. Another link to uh, deliver offshore strategy targets uh, is the inf infrastructure. We welcome the proposal of a new TNE regulation and new priority offshore grid corridors. Yet we regret that the proposal doesn't include directly radial offshore electricity infrastructure not creating a direct, uh, a direct uh, interconnection between the member states as potential projects of common interests. We encourage the legislators to reconsider this approach in the spirit of making green offshore wind electricity the goal of our common interest. Offshore wind development is crucial for the whole energy sector in the European Union. European economies are ambitious in setting their green targets. Yet to achieve them, the most important is not to involve all stakeholders in cooperation and dialogue at uh, the earliest stage, especially offshore wind farms developers. Ultimately, bearing the biggest investment and financial risks. As you can see, there is a lot to talk about. 
I would like to warmly welcome, welcome our distinguished guests today. We have the best of the best when uh, it comes to discuss offshore energy. I invite you all to a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Wojciech, for joining us this afternoon. And now it is my pleasure to welcome that panel of distinguished guests, uh, starting with Kadri Simpson, uh, Commissioner for Energy. Uh, also joining us today is Giles Dixon, Chief Executive Officer of Wind Europe. We also have Patrick Greichen, Executive Director of Agora Energy Vende, and Michal Kurtika, uh, Minister for Climate and Environment of Poland. So welcome to you all. And before we get into this spirited panel discussion, I would like to remind our audience that you can participate in this event. So remember, uh, you can tweet at it at political events and ask questions via Slido using the hashtag EUWindEnergy for both platforms. And please make sure to put your name as it is much nicer to know who is asking those questions. I would also like to remind you that the poll is still ongoing. There are a lot of participants, and we would certainly like to get your viewpoint. So uh, you have until the end of the event to participate in that poll, which we remind you is on the question of what is needed to boost the EU's offshore wind sector and meet the bloc's 2050 climate targets. Uh, so I would also like to tell our panelists, please don't hesitate to wave at me if you'd like to interact with one another, if you have any rebuttals to uh, comments made by uh, the other members. So without further ado, uh, Commissioner Simpson, I'd like to start with you. Uh, as we know, in order to meet the goal of climate neutrality by 2050, uh, the European Commission presented its offshore energy strategy last year. And that proposes increasing Europe's offshore wind capacity from its current level of 12 gigawatts to at least 60 gigawatts by 2030, 300 gigawatts by 2050. That is a remarkably heavy lift. Now that the strategy is out, what are the next steps for the Commission? Uh, should we expect the upcoming Fit for 55 package to include concrete measures to boost offshore winds growth? And what about the recovery plans? Could recovery cash go to fund offshore projects? And if so, do you know of any countries that are looking forward to do that? Uh, Commissioner Simpson. Yes, thank you for this question. And, uh, and indeed, well, I truly believe in useful tools and offshore renewable energy is definitely one of the best tools in our toolbox when we talk about uh, building up climate neutral economy. And you know that uh, right now we are preparing this uh, Fit for 55 uh, package. Uh, we will start negotiations uh, with member states after that to, to raise our renewable targets. Current uh, level is uh, at least 32, but uh, this is uh, clearly not enough. And, uh, and uh, we know that um, the share of renewables in our energy mix is uh, right now around 20%. So that means that, that we have to scale up very fast. And offshore energy, uh, and especially offshore wind, uh, has the potential to do that. So um, um, on top of that, that, um, that uh, we will have additional financing, we need to well, uh, negotiate with member states uh, what are their plans. Um, uh, unfortunately, offshore wind parks uh, need uh, a little bit uh, longer planning um, time uh, than, uh, than um, other climate-friendly solutions where uh, member states can use uh, their um, uh, recovery funds. Uh, but uh, I do know that uh, at least uh, several member states are still uh, planning to invest also into the offshore projects. And, um, and uh, of course, from our perspective, it is uh, very important to uh, create a predictable environment for our uh, uh, private investors. Um, and um, definitely also noticed that right now we are in the position where we are negotiating with uh, uh, member states and, uh, and um, European Parliament, the DENE regulation, but also uh, broadens the scope for uh, creed connections, uh, both for uh, onshore and offshore uh, um, um, projects. So, um, we put this uh, plan already, um, we put it forward uh, in the end of the last year. And, and um, what we propose uh, for offshore is a sea basin uh, uh, base framework for the grid development that covers both um, um, onshore and offshore grids, and also um, um, uh, 
uh, our TENI proposal uh, makes onshore and offshore grids eligible for the SEF funding. So, um, so um, cooperation projects uh, can apply for additional financing. The financing doesn't need to come directly for, uh, for, uh, from uh, um, so-called member states' uh, budgets. And well, the other concrete steps to facilitate investments in the renewable finance is renewable financing mechanism that uh, motivates countries without um, create conditions themselves um, to fund projects elsewhere. And of course, um, um, we, we um, uh, push them to do so, so that they will uh, meet uh, higher targets, um, even, even in the situation where they don't have coastal waters or or they don't have uh, spare land uh, re reserves. So, Commissioner, with, with precisely with that, with the mechanism that you were mentioning, this is a way for offshore wind to really be something that involves all of Europe and not just uh, the, the coastal uh, member countries. Is that, is that right? Yes, this is indeed uh, one uh, solution how member states uh, can, uh, can achieve their targets um, by financing um, uh, offshore projects. And of course, when we presented our offshore strategy, then we saw that there was broad support uh, because we covered all the sea basins, but also because we showed that there is a um, supply chain or industry behind uh, uh, offshore that also uh, uh, gives um, jobs and uh, business opportunities for uh, landlocked countries. And there, this is indeed the case that there are uh, production sites uh, for necessary uh, um, parts um, even in the countries that uh, themselves don't have uh, coastal waters. So turning to a country that actually has a, a coastal interest in this, uh, I'd, I'd like to turn to Minister Kurtika. Uh, Minister, uh, Poland has historically been known as, as one of the most coal-friendly uh, countries in, in the Union, but lately you guys have been making a, a, a very notable pivot towards offshore wind. I'm, I'm curious to hear a bit more about uh, why exactly, that, how, what, what motivated that, if it was motivated more uh, due to climate concerns or due to economic concerns. And I'm curious to hear what role national governments can can play in really boosting out offshore wind at the rate that is needed to meet our climate targets? Uh, thank you very much for starting with stereotypical image of Poland. So <laughs> even when we are talking about offshore wind, we cannot avoid starting from coal. But and, surely, surely uh, you can see that it's true, right? That, that Poland has historically been deeply, deeply associated with coal. Uh, 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 yes, uh, yes. Uh, so I I if it is to justify your question, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so you were, you were saying, uh, how, how do you plan on, on attracting investment into offshore wind as part of this, uh, this green pivot that, uh, that you guys are leading from Warsaw? Yes, and, and we are right now in a very interesting situation here in Poland. And coming back uh, jokingly, of course, to your, uh, to your initial question uh, in this regard, we started um, as a country in a very particular situation because in 1989, 97% of our energy was provided by coal. It is right now less than 70%. Um, and the problem is that we have an aging infrastructure and we need in any way to do something. And in this regard, it's very interesting to see the development of uh, technological developments um, and also um, uh, investment stimulus, uh, for example, with uh, recovery and resilience instruments, which can help us um, to boost a new uh, energy system. And uh, if we are talking about the role of the government, it's crucial. And that's uh, obvious. We do not need uh, to, uh, to, to justify it. I, but but I, I will just uh, take three uh, elements, why I think it is important and why we here in Poland take uh, uh, this responsibility very seriously um, in, uh, in precisely in documents that we have already adopted. First, it's a long um, uh, change. Um, uh, we uh, adopted in the beginning of February here in Poland a new uh, energy strategy by 2030, which foresees a complete change uh, in the way uh, the energy will be produced uh, uh, in Poland. Um, and this uh, is based on uh, three pillars, just transition, new zero emission energy system and clean air. And when we are speaking, uh, talking about um, uh, the second pillar, zero emission system, the, the scope of the, uh, of the ambition is enormous as we should within the next 20 years 
to build a new zero emission energy system, which is of the size of the magnitude of the existing conventional one. And uh, offshore wind is in this regard an extremely important strategic tar target for us, an extremely important um, industrial uh, field, and an extremely important element of uh, energy uh, competitiveness and energy security uh, in the coming decades. So this is why we have adopted um, uh, the uh, Offshore Wind Act, and here again uh, another element of this role of the state, it is to provide clear rules of the game. So it's a long-term game, and this is why it needs government. It is a game which requires clear rules. And here we have adopted on the 17th of uh, February, uh, a new Offshore Wind Act has entered into force. Um, and uh, it uh, foresees that by 2030, we will develop um, 5,900 megawatts of uh, capacity uh, in the Baltic Sea, and by 2040, between 8 to 11,000 megawatts of installed capacities. That's an enormous project, that's an enormous target, which will be developed in two stages. First stage, um, which will be negotiated project by project, and the second one starting from 2025, uh, tender based. And uh, we discussed this framework a lot uh, with the European Commission. And I would like to thank Kadri uh, Simpson um, uh, for uh, her involvement uh, in this uh, in this regard, and uh, for our mutual dialogue, which helps us indeed uh, to make sure that the potential of offshore wind is in Poland fully used. And the, the third uh, thing which re uh, requires, I think, which justifies also the role of the state, uh, is the fact that Baltic Sea, by definition, uh, is not only uh, a sea um, uh, of Poland, neither of Germany nor of Sweden. We have to think about this uh, resource uh, as a common good as a common public good. And this is why also with the support of Kadri Simpson, and thank you very much again, uh, in Szczecin uh, on the 30th of September last year, we launched Baltic Declaration uh, on offshore wind. And uh, I would like to thank very much the commission, which right now facilitates the work of a working group, which will set up an agenda uh, of uh, how we should deploy this Baltic uh, declaration uh, in practice. So it's a long-term game. Uh, we need the state to take its responsibility by defining what it requires, what it wishes uh, in terms of new energy system. Uh, it's a game which requires clear, um, uh, uh, clear uh, s rules. And uh, it's a game which requires uh, uh, a cooperation among countries. And uh, we uh, are uh, willing uh, to do our part, and we are willing uh, to work together not only with countries, but also with stakeholders. And so we launched a um, uh, Polish offshore uh, wind uh, sectoral deal, uh, which right now regroups uh, more than 150 people in six working groups. It's extremely popular here in Poland. People are really um, very much involved because we see as a completely new opportunity uh, for the economy, also in terms of just transition. Uh, and we need also to think about uh, Polish co-dependent regions in terms of new jobs opportunities. And here, interestingly, also for offshore wind, it is possible uh, to think about some production uh, installation inside uh, the country, even in Silesia. So very interesting. And thank you very much, um, Gilles Dixon, because we were speaking a lot about it. And I hope that we can provide also with concrete examples about this just transition of offshore wind and coal. And uh, I'm very happy that, uh, that we can advance very quickly in the last 15 months here in Poland uh, in this field. Uh, Minister, I, I just want to follow up with that since you've, since you've insisted a lot on the just transition and certainly there's enormous potential there. As you well know, Poland stands to lose half of what it could receive from the just transition unless it commits to the uh, 2050 climate target. Can we expect that commitment? 
<laughs> let's uh, let's wait right now uh, for the uh, for the results uh, of the discussions re regarding climate law, and let's not forget uh, that there is an objective reality uh, of Poland, which has been recognized by. Uh, all other member states in the conclusions uh, in December 2019, yes, we aim for climate neutrality, yes, it's a, it's a common objective, it's a common aspiration and ambition, and yes, we want to loyally put uh, our share in this, but there is a, a starting point, which is, by the way, right now, and you started with this, uh, with the coal um, equation and mosaic, we have right now uh, at the last stage of negotiating, of negotiating a deal between government and mining trade unions. So it's an interesting, extremely dynamic field of, uh, of, uh, of political, economic, social dialogue here in Poland that has been opened uh, with these new opportunities uh, and new challenges of energy transition. Okay. Uh, Giles, I'd like to, uh, to bring you in on this conversation. As a CEO of Win Europe, I'm sure you have many recommendations for both the Commission and, uh, and national governments as to how they could uh, get offshore wind really growing. I'm curious for you to maybe tell us the, the top three that you would uh, really recommend that they dig into. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So the top three recommendations from the European wind industry for how to deliver these ambitious goals of 60 gigawatts offshore wind by 2030 and then 300 gigawatts by 2050 in the EU are as follows. Number one, get the maritime spatial planning right. Number two, invest in grids, both offshore and onshore. And number three, expand the supply chain so that we can be sure that all of these offshore wind turbines will be made in Europe. I'd like, if I may, to, to thank and congratulate both Minister Kurtika and Commissioner Simpson for the excellent leadership that they are both showing on the build-out of offshore wind. From Minister Kurtika, you've heard the figures. It's a very ambitious growth path for Poland on offshore wind. It's very significant also how offshore wind will contribute to the just energy transition in Poland and elsewhere. Already, the offshore wind industry has created 10,000 jobs in northern Poland in former shipbuilding, in shipbuilding areas. Apologies, Minister. Around Gdańsk, Gdynia, and, and Szczecin. And that's before Poland has even built any of its own offshore wind farms yet. So these are 10,000 jobs producing equipment for offshore wind farms, all of them currently for export to other countries. The Commissioner has tabled an excellent strategy for the build-out of offshore renewable energy. And in support of that, it's very good, Commissioner, that you've also tabled the proposals now for the revision of the 10E regulation. The investments in grids are crucial, as I've said, to the build-out of offshore wind. There are two particular elements of your 10E proposal that are extremely important. The first is the proposal which you've alluded to, Commissioner, for a sea basin approach to maritime spatial planning, this idea of a one-stop shop for each sea basin to coordinate and facilitate the planning and permitting of offshore wind farms and the grid connections. And it's very important, Minister Kurtika, that you and all of your ministerial colleagues in the Council support that proposal from the Commissioner, specifically Article 8.6 of the 10E regulation. The second element of the 10E proposal that is so important is your proposal, Commissioner, for integrated offshore wind development planning. Again, as per each sea basin. This is Article 14.2 of the regulation. And again, Minister Kurtika, it's very important that you and your ministerial colleagues should be supporting that in the Council. Thank you. That's a, that's a lot of direct pressure there on, on both the, uh, the commissioner and the, and the minister. Patrick, uh, what about you? I'm curious to, to hear your thoughts as to uh, your perspective in terms of what Brussels and the national capitals can do. And I'd, I'd also like to hear from, from the, from the non-industry industry perspective, uh, do, you, do you think that uh, so much attention should be falling, so much, so much uh, pressure should be falling on the, on the weight of offshore wind? Uh, does it does it really merit uh, this much attention? Is it really the silver bullet, or should we giving uh, should we be giving the same level of attention and enthusiasm to other renewable energy sources? 
Yes, thanks for that question. Maybe I'll start with that. Uh, in essence, uh, it, there are three silver bullets for uh, reaching climate neutrality, uh, and that's wind offshore, wind onshore, and solar PV. And we need to uh, have all three of them really be pushed because uh, they're needed to get electricity green and then also to produce green hydrogen so we can gas, uh, get gas green. So uh, in essence, uh, in all of those three technologies, and they are, they are the cheap renewables, they are the ones where we can uh, basically have uh, no additional cost compared to a fossil fuel system. So th that's important to, to, to really focus on those three uh, and, and push them uh, up to the limit. Now, within the wind offshore discussion, um, I, I would like to um, echo what Giles has said um, and, and maybe push it a bit more. Um, what, what we will really need is that the Renewable Directive, which we will see in, in June, um, has that strong, bold uh, statement in there. Um, meaning, so what is it, how do we simplify permitting procedures? How do we make spatial planning such that it gives priority to wind offshore, wind onshore, uh, especially? Uh, how do we, um, when it comes to the Baltic Sea and the North Sea, the Atlantic Ocean, uh, have, have a planning of those offshore areas soon up so that we can install 20 gigawatts per year? And that's what we're talking about. Um, it, it is about, um, if, if we look at the numbers, it's, it's essentially a renewable-based power system all over Europe in 2030, which an average share uh, of some uh, 65, 67 percent renewables uh, in the European power mix 2030. And therefore, um, we're not talking about small scale anymore. We're talking about uh, really big time building the uh, planning fast, building it, and having the grids so that it really can be transported. Um, one last sentence: those that are uh, that don't have a coast, for example, uh, the Czech neighbor of Poland and Germany, um, they can't just buy uh, uh, certificates from Poland and, and, and Germany because, at the end of the day, they need power. And uh, if we look at climate neutrality, there is no coal and gas power plant anymore. So at the end, they will then import wind offshore through either Poland or Germany. And we need to have uh, deals for that. We need to have grids for that. And we need to plan for that. Okay, so I see a strong push there for uh, for infrastructure. You you actually you raise a valid point that I wanted to raise with you, Commissioner Simpson. In in terms of the of the upcoming revision of the uh, Renewable Energy Directive, should we expect anything there to address the issue of the? very cumbersome uh, permitting process. Uh, will there be steps taken to make this uh, something much more fluid, some, something much more faster so that we can actually get projects on the go? Well, uh, we do know that spatial planning is important. And, uh, and uh, indeed, um, well, in our um, offshore energy strategy, um, there are 31 action points uh, in the strategy, many of which are already being implemented. Um, and to summarize very briefly, well, we need better planning, um, but we also need a more regional cooperation and, um, and uh, updated market rules and, uh, and the strong supply chain. And I can't say that, uh, that uh, we will find a solution that prioritizes um, um, offshore uh, wind park planning uh, because there are other actors who are historically there in the same uh, uh, territories, defense, shipping, uh, fisheries, environmental concerns. And I think that we have to learn from the first movers. Well, um, Northeast um, Cooperation is a very good example where um, multi-use um, is actually already existing. And they can show that uh, there are different economical uh, actors um, who can continue their activities or we can take care of environmental issues um, at the same time when we are planning uh, new offshore wind parks. Um, so um, so these, these are the concerns uh, that we have to keep in mind and, uh, and we will keep in mind. 
um, but but also uh, planning the creeds, um, 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 extending ten e regulation to offshore wind uh, uh, creeds. Um, um, definitely, it is um, a step uh, to the um, simpler planning process and faster, uh, because um, this is clear that uh, that uh, we need significantly scale up uh, offshore wind capacity. Um, well, business as usual will not help us in, uh, in doing so, and uh, and uh, in uh, in this regard, um, one-stop shops and sea basin level planning. Um, both were meant uh, to, fo uh, to foster the, the um, development in offshore and not only in wind and bottom fixed wind. And uh, there is also a, a great potential for innovative solutions. So research and innovation still plays a role uh, for tidal and uh, wave energy and also for, uh, um, for uh, floating wind because uh, well, there are some sea basins where they don't have such a favorable um, um, shallow coastal waters uh, than we do have in the northern uh, part of Europe in the North Seas and the uh, Baltic Sea. Indeed. Uh, Minister, uh, in, in, in this vein, uh, so one of, the, one of the complaints that I've heard is that uh, sometimes there just isn't enough people power to, to process the, uh, the permits. Uh, do you, does your country have any plans to expand its, uh, I suppose, the bureaucracy that would be dealing with, uh, with these issues as you uh, start betting more and more on, on offshore wind? Uh, thank you very much for asking this question to a public servant. Yes, <laughs> it's a beautiful question, saying that we are not enough and that we should be provided with more people, more resources and more money. Yes, indeed, I can su subscribe to this. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and of course, yes, um, again, jokingly speaking, of course, we are aware of the fact that it's a new um, field of economic activity. We want to open it, so we need to provide resources. Uh, we are right now working on a, a maritime spatial plan. We want to, uh, to finalize it by uh, soon. It is uh, right now uh, just ahead of the publication and uh, adaptation by the Council of Ministers. Uh, it is an extremely important plan um, uh, and it will also certainly define new opportunities uh, in the Baltic Sea. Uh, in the seashore um, uh, for economic activity, and then we will be uh, we will be certainly uh, also asking prime ministers uh, prime minister for, for for more resources in this regard. But um, but uh, I, I think also that uh, sometimes we should be uh, again a little bit. Uh, uh, critical towards ourselves and and uh, and uh, acknowledge that not everything can be solved or should be solved immediately by by a new bureaucratic uh, um, uh, solution. So this is why we have um, uh, launched last year uh, last year together with the Commission um, this Baltic Declaration, which should um, create a, a coordination and a dedicated secretariat. Uh, for the Baltic Sea uh, and especially for the for the offshore wind uh, planning and, and developments, a little bit uh, uh, as it is right now uh, in the North Sea, uh, taking lessons learned from the North Sea, but also um, uh, bringing other ideas to the table, and then giving time to time, giving uh, scope and uh, and uh, possibility for actors, stakeholders. Uh, um, to a little bit fine-tune, to, to work together and to develop uh, new forms, uh, new um, opportunities uh, for cooperation. And so in this regard, uh, I think and we think it would be a little bit premature to go directly to a new bureaucratic solution, which would be another agency, uh, another shop uh, or whatever we call it. And uh, uh, rather than doing this, again, which would be uh, very much um, in line with, uh, let's say, a natural DNA of a public administration, provide more space for stakeholders uh, to, uh, to, uh, to work together to coordinate their actions, especially that we already have a number of bodies. We have, for example, Helcom. 
which helps um, to coordinate uh, plans uh, for the Baltic Sea. So we have bodies which are dedicated for that. We have uh, instruments, we have people, we have a new area of opportunity, which is offshore wind, and we should advance uh, carefully in order not to uh, go uh, too quickly uh, for solutions uh, which would seem perfect from the perspective of the public servant, but probably would uh, miss some opportunities that would be developed otherwise by uh, cooperation of uh, stakeholders. Uh, Patrick, both uh, both the Commissioner and the Minister have uh, have mentioned uh, the issue of maritime spatial planning. You've been a, a vocal advocate for uh, tapping every bit of the North Sea's offshore wind potential, uh, especially for the production of green hydrogen. Uh, but you've warned that the measure will not be limited by cost, but rather by space. So uh, clearly touching on this issue. What are, what are your views on how space can be uh, best managed to uh, to avoid dust ups uh, between uh, between the players in the region? Well, actually, uh, I mean, uh, there is, of course, limited potential uh, if we look at the coast. Uh, and and there is the risk that um, the ones more west uh, shadow, basically, uh, the spaces uh, more in the east when it comes to the wind potential. So w what we will actually be needing is um, a joint planning procedure because uh, otherwise um, we won't use the whole potential of the North Sea um, as best as possible. And, and, and that's, I mean, we, we currently always have that, of course, onshore planning. So when you build a new onshore wind uh, uh, farm, you have to look at whether uh, the wind there uh, and what are the shadow effects of a, of, a, of a different wind onshore farm. And we will have that same effect now when we build more and more wind offshore. So uh, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm so uh, pointing at this, that we need... Um, cooperation and we need the European Commission to play a, a good role there so that we have uh, basically a cross-country cross planning uh, so that um, we use the whole potential of the North Sea and the Baltic Sea um, as best as possible. Giles, I'll, I'll jump to you in a second, but first I want to I want to ask the commissioner since since Patrick just mentioned it. Commissioner, how do you see what what do you see the the commission's role as being in in this context? Will you will you guys serve as a sort of arbiter? Or are you are you are you planning on having more direct involvement in in the issue of maritime spatial planning? Well, um, the sea basins um, are um, well cooperating regionally, and uh, and as you know, uh, in for example, in North Sea's energy operation uh, platform, we are holding the co-chair's position. So, uh, so of course, we're guiding all the sea basins to follow these kind of um, cooperation models. And, and uh, well, and well um, there are always some, uh, some things that we can um, uh, better. So, uh, so uh, of course, with all the uh, initiatives that are coming out from our services, also for the Renewable Energy Directive, uh, we will uh, keep in mind the needs of the offshore renewable sector. So with permitting, um, joint planning and cooperation between member states, these are in our scope. Lovely. Uh, Giles, uh as we know, uh, or, or as, as we imagine, spatial planning goes beyond countries and also involves industry, which is, I believe, something that the, that the minister touched on before. Uh, so how do we also achieve a peaceful coexistence between the other players in the sea, by which I mean, for example, the, the fisheries sector? Uh, what, do you, what, do you, uh, what do you propose in, in that, in that uh, frame? In each country, and also across each sea basin, you need to gather people together in meeting rooms. You need two things in those meeting rooms. You need big maps on big tables, and you need all of the stakeholders. That is to say, the people who are going to build the wind farms and operate them, the TSOs who are going to build and operate the grid connections. You need the governments. You need the fishing industry, the shipping industry, the military and the environmental interests. And they need to work out between themselves, first at a national level, and then in cooperation, or at the same time in cooperation with their neighbours in their respective sea basins, where all of these offshore wind farms are going and where the grid connections are going. And they need to have an idea also which are going to be the so-called hybrid offshore wind farms that Mr Dobrovsky was talking about 
earlier. That is to say those offshore wind farms that have grid connections to two or more countries. That needs very careful planning and coordination. Of course, an industry needs to be part of all of those discussions. Excellent. Uh, Patrick, turning to you, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the, uh, the tendential uh, implications of, of this offshore wind boom. Uh, and, and this has been raised by several of uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, audience members following this event. Uh, through their questions, they've asked, you know, beyond turbines, what else do we need? Uh, and many have obviously mentioned grids, which is a, a topic that has already come up here. Uh, so. What do we need? What else do we need beyond, uh, beyond the classic uh, wind turbine spinning in the sea? Yes, okay. Yeah, grids is, uh, grids is one thing, and it's not only offshore grid, but then also uh, the onshore grid. Uh, so to really transport the power then to the uh, industrial centers. The, but the second big thing will be electrolysis. Um, uh, we, we will need green hydrogen to replace uh, basically gas in the industry sector, and also um, to power our, um, our power plants in those times when there is no, neither wind nor sun. And uh, I'm not talking about transport here, by the way, but I'm talking about industry and the energy sector uh, in those times without wind and sun. Um, but nevertheless, those are huge amounts if you really scale them up over the whole of Europe. And, uh, and I, I don't believe in importing hydrogen from Saudi Arabia or somewhere else as a cheap option. Um, it, it is always better um, to produce stuff at home because then you don't have import costs. And wind offshore uh, plus wind onshore and solar PV in Southern Europe, those are the two key possibilities for Europe to produce hydrogen homegrown. And therefore, we have to evaluate. Do we do that at the coast? Or maybe do we want electrolysis directly at the wind offshore farm and then have uh, the hydrogen pipeline? Uh, but that's the next big thing. And we need to uh, sort that out uh, already now. So uh, going, going off a bit on, on what you just said, Patrick, and also something that you mentioned before when you were saying that the focus should, of course, be on offshore, but also on onshore and on solar, and, and you really emphasize the need to, uh, to push forward with that. I want to uh, take another question from the audience. So I see that Joanna Filsowska, uh, I believe, is directing this one towards uh, the minister. She asks, uh, when, Poland, when will Poland review the law that for the last five years has completely blocked onshore wind development? So to that end, uh, you know, you guys are obviously moving forward with offshore, but should we also expect uh, similar progress on, on the onshore side? Thank you very much. Uh, yes, we have a lot of development um, on the onshore wind um, as well. Uh, we have more than 6,000 megawatts of onshore wind already installed and um, more than 3,000 uh, megawatts in the pipelines of projects which are being developed right now. Uh, so we will soon reach uh, more than 10,000 megawatts uh, in uh, onshore wind. Uh, and um, uh, we are working together with uh, colleagues in the Ministry of um, uh, Development, uh, with Prime Minister uh, Govin, um, on uh, on future uh, uh, on the future uh, also. And uh, it is uh, uh, it is uh, one uh, act which is uh, which is being proposed by Prime Minister Govin uh, in this regard. But I wanted also to touch um, uh, a word about hydrogen. I think it is uh, an extremely interesting uh, opportunity for all of us. Um, we have presented at the beginning of uh, January uh, our hypothesis, our guidelines for uh, a strategy which is being developed uh, uh, for hydrogen. Uh, it includes 2,000 megawatts of electrolyzers. And uh, an important place uh, for these electrolyzers to work, of course, will be together with uh, offshore wind uh, farms um, in the northern Poland. For the moment, our maritime spatial plan, which has been, by the way, carefully developed with a lot, a lot of intensive work of uh, consultation, cooperation, including fisheries and all other uh, activities, just as uh, Gilles uh, mentioned it, and as you asked the question, mm -hmm. it took us three years and we are at the final stage of adopting it. 
Uh, but somehow, three years ago, we didn't know that uh, this kind of uh, opportunities will be uh, uh, existing, for example, of locating at the same time an offshore wind farm and a hydrogen electrolyzer. So for the moment, we'll rather go for electrolyzers on the, on the shore. I don't think it will change that much dramatically, uh, the, the thing. The, the essence is uh, to be able um, to, to engage in, uh, in some uh, projects uh, in a coordinated manner within European Union uh, so that we are able to develop this uh, uh, hydrogen as a new industry. And I think it would be also extremely important that we bet on zero emission um, hydrogen and that we bet on technological neutrality. So it is not important whether we are, uh, for marketing purposes, uh, going to color uh, the hydrogen in this or that way. The importance is uh, whether uh, this hydrogen that we produce is harmful or not in terms of emission of um, uh, of, uh, of gases, uh, especially of CO2. So my, my guess, uh, my bet would be, uh, let's make sure that the hydrogen that we produce in, uh, in, within European Union is really zero emission, but let's not uh, be uh, going uh, for excluding this or that way of producing this zero emission energy that can help us uh, to fuel these electrolyzers. Okay. I'm, I'm going to take another question from the audience. This is from Peter, who is asking about the North Seas and uh, co cooperation with the UK post-Brexit. So, uh, Commissioner Simpson, could you, could, you, uh, could you address that topic? Yes, of course. Well, um, well uh, in their climate uh, ambitions, UK, uh, um, UK is our... Um, good, uh, like-minded partner, and they are uh, really ambitious ones. Uh, but after Brexit, uh, we all know that um, they are um, not committed um, to the um, market, uh, open market uh, principles. And in uh, this regard, um, UK, um, after the Brexit, uh, is no longer a member of the North Sea Energy Operation. Uh, but I strongly believe um, that cooperation with the UK regarding offshore energy has to continue. So, um, but probably I do support I, them coming back in, right? Well, I do support the um, unified European approach um, towards re establishing a collaborative framework. But of course, it has to be in uh, there has to be level playing fields. They have to commit uh, to the uh, um, to the principles uh, that there are no, um, um, well, um, no unfair um, competition from their side. And, and of course, uh, we do expect that uh, this level playing field in the sea territory will be also in other sectors. So, um, but, um, but well, overall, they are a um, committed partner to achieve climate neutrality and, and in this regard, uh, also committed to, to invest uh, a lot in offshore. All right, sounds like a like a tough circle to square over the over the next couple of years, uh, Giles. I, uh, I I would like to turn to you since maybe you can tell us a little bit about the future. Uh, you know, obviously we have a lot of movement right now in the North and Baltic seas, and we have these uh, these pioneer floating wind projects off the coast of Portugal. But uh, I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts as to what we uh, might expect in the coming decades. You know, if you were imagining the EU of 2050, where else should we expect to see offshore wind blossoming? Should we, should we expect to see it in all of our, our seas? Should we expect, you know, uh, floating wind turbines to be found off the coast of Italy and, and in the Aegean and, and possibly even in the Black Sea? So offshore wind is rapidly becoming a whole Europe affair. And I think, Commissioner, your strategy last year played a key role in helping to drive this. Greece is preparing an offshore wind act. They've identified zones around their islands where they want to build floating offshore wind farms. Spain is preparing an offshore wind strategy, both for the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. You've mentioned Portugal. Italy is developing offshore wind farms as well in the Adriatic. Romania and Bulgaria are both very interested in exploiting the huge potential that is there in the Black Sea. Now, as the Commissioner has already suggested, floating offshore wind is going to play a key role here. Most of the offshore wind we have in Europe today is what we call bottom fixed. It's 
fixed to the seabed. But you can only do that in sea depths of up to 50 meters. Beyond 50 meters, it has to be floating. And in the Mediterranean, that means we have to do floating, and in much of the Atlantic as well. The really good news here is that floating offshore wind is rapidly coming of age. You've mentioned the Portuguese project. There's a project in Scotland as well. Within two to three years of now, Europe will have 300 megawatts of floating offshore wind farms in operation. And by the end of this decade, there will be seven gigawatts in total. This year, France is holding an auction for a large scale floating offshore wind farm off the coast of Brittany. It will repeat that exercise next year. Norway is doing a lot in this area as well. The technology is there. We know it works. It's a bit more expensive than bottom fixed offshore wind today, but with economies of scale, the costs will fall rapidly, just as they have done for conventional bottom fixed offshore wind. Um, Patrick, could I could I uh, could I bring you in? I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts also with that with that uh, future perspective. Uh, we know that onshore has had uh, problems with its development because of the you know, I hate to use the term, but the, the not in the in my backyard crowd. Do you do you expect similar uh, obstacles uh, with the development of offshore wind, or, or is uh, precisely its nature? away from populations and, and, uh, and deep in, in, relatively deep in the ocean, uh, does, that, does that save it from at least uh, that, that side of the, of the controversy? Uh, yes, but um, there are still nature conservation issues, uh, uh, especially in the North Sea, uh, but I, I also, I guess, uh, in, in the Mediterranean, where, where I don't know exactly the issues. But um, so you always have to... I heard from the uh, Greeks that there are, there are concerns about tourism, for example, near their, their more touristic actually islands. Actually, we, yeah. had, we had a lot of tourism discussions in Germany as well with the first wind offshore parks. Uh, and and uh, the, the, the islands uh, were saying, well, we don't think uh, tourists will come anymore. At the end of the day, <laughs> it turned out that, um, that day trips to the wind offshore uh, farm was actually an, an additional value to those oh. uh, tourists. So, so I think we will manage there. Um, the, the issue is really, of course, you have different challenges. You have more grid challenges. Uh, you, have, uh, you need to um, uh, have offshore and onshore grid. Um, and that's what then drives the costs there. So uh, I guess um, my main point is um, there's so much renewable power we need. Um, we did our study for climate neutral Germany, and the same applies for all over Europe, that in 2050, power demand will rise uh, some 50% because we're electrifying transport, we're electrifying heating, um, and therefore we need every bit we can get. Excellent. I, I I like that idea of the uh, of the of the of the offshore wind uh, tourism board. That's that's uh, that sounds pretty exciting. Um, uh, touching on on one of the issues that you that you mentioned, which is obviously the the environmental concerns. Uh, Minister, just turning, or excuse me, Commissioner, turning to you. Uh, how are you how are you marrying the uh, the offshore renewable energy strategy with biodiversity concerns? Uh, because I, I I assume that the Commission is also looking out for that, given its its commitments in that direction as well. Absolutely. And when we prepared our offshore energy strategy, then it wasn't uh, only our uh, um, um, well, input, but, uh, but it was in close uh, cooperation with other commissioners, especially with, with Gino Sinkiewicz, who is, uh, uh, who is also responsible for um, maritime spatial planning. And, uh, and uh, in this regard, uh, well, we know that, um, that um, offshore has a waste potential especially compared with other uh, renewables, because um, there, we can solve the spatial planning, uh, um, but we have to keep in mind that uh, the crete costs uh, increase the further away uh, from shore uh, the wind farms uh, are planned. So, uh, so um, this is the major problem that the best locations for wind farms uh, might be taken by other, uh, by other um, actors. Uh, but overall, we also know uh, how much it might uh, cost us to implement the strategy to achieve our very uh, ambitious targets for 2050. And, and again, but two thirds um, of the costs, well, we, we predict will be creed related. 
of course, uh, both for offshore reads and strengthening our onshore reads. Um, and well, this, uh, this um, plays an important role what kind of uh, territories are planned for offshore wind parts. And the competition with other, other sectors is uh, in this regard also. This might be costly. Uh, Minister, can I, can I toss that question to you as well? How are, uh, how are you uh, striking the balance there between, uh, between development and biodiversity concerns? If, I, if I'm not mistaken, Poland had, uh, had, has planned some wind farms that are partially on, on Natura sites, but they, they've, uh, they've also been, been analyzed, or am I, am I wrong there? No, no. All our wind, uh, offshore winds are supposed to be in the um, economic area and not in the first uh, line. Uh, uh, so so we, we clearly separated the tourism <laughs> uh, from economic activity. And we also very carefully uh, designed um, uh, environmental uh, uh, studies uh, in order to make sure that uh, there is no harm for the nature. It is extremely important uh, for us. And uh, maritime spatial plan, which I mentioned previously, also takes this perspective of biodiversity. Uh, Natura 2000 areas, uh, which um, are protected and uh, uh, which um, are left alone, uh, and not uh, uh, it's not possible to build uh, any offshore wind farm on these territories. So it is, uh, it is a very crucial concern for us, which has been taken into account into procedures, legal procedures, but also in, in this maritime spatial plan. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, Giles, a, a very specific question from uh, Emin. He asks, copper is used in the production of turbines as well as transmission lines, but its resources have 10 years of life at current rate. Uh, which, should we being, we, which should we prioritize? Uh, which should we prioritize between? <laughs> between uh, the turbines and the transmission lines. I assume they're both equally important. Well, I mean, the two <laughs> need each other. You don't build one without having the, the, the other. Um, but it's true that there are a lot of very important materials and components that go into an offshore wind turbine. By the way, every time Europe builds an offshore wind turbine, that generates 15 million euros worth of economic activity. And at a time when jobs, growth, investments are at an absolute premium, that's very important for us, the economic value of offshore wind. It can help to drive a large part of our economic recovery. You talked about the EU recovery plan at the very start, Ito, and we touched on national recovery and resilience plans. We've talked about infrastructure investments. There's one important part of infrastructure investments we haven't touched on, and that's ports. Ports are crucial to the expansion of offshore wind. You can't do offshore wind without investing in ports. You need huge space. The blades for the latest turbines are now over 100 meters long. You've got to lie them down before you lift them up onto the ships. And when you lift them up, you need steel reinforced heavy loading key sides that can bear 30 tons per square meter of lifting. You then need deep berths for the jack-up vessels that come in and take all the equipment out to the offshore wind farms. Just this decade alone, Europe's ports between them need to invest over 6 billion euros in their infrastructure to support the expansion of offshore wind. France, in its recovery and resilience plan, has singled out ports for investment. Uh, Minister Kotyka, it may be something you wish to look at as you're finalizing Poland's plan uh, as well. And Commissioner, it's something we would encourage you uh, to, to try and include in as many of the recovery and resilience plans as possible. It, it sounds like a lot of money, but also a lot of jobs. And uh, I, I believe, as uh, the minister mentioned before, I see him raising his hand. We, we're almost out of time, so you, I'll, I'll, I'll pass you the word because I know that you have... Uh, a lot of jobs being created at uh, Polish ports in, in relation to this. And, and Giles, I'm, I'm well aware from friends down in Vienna, the Gestelo, down in Portugal, that as well. They're, they're very excited about the, the potential there with the, with the floating side. Uh, Minister, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, yes, uh, we, have, we are blessed in Poland to have already a, a whole value chain for, for offshore wind, as was mentioned by Gilles. Uh, thousands of people are working without having a single uh, offshore wind turbine on, on Polish seashore. So it's time to catch up. And indeed, I wanted uh, to, to, to react to what uh, Gilles uh, has just said. 
We also included in our recovery and resilience um, uh, instrument, so in our uh, national recovery plan, uh, 437 million euro uh, for um, uh, a terminal for a port, uh, which would be will be dedicated uh, to concentrate this uh, uh, economic uh, ecosystem of building and then servicing uh, wind offshore farms on Polish seashore, but also beyond, as we uh, know that uh, it is uh, a, a Baltic Sea-wide uh, project. Excellent. Well, we are uh, basically out of time, but before we go, uh, let's, uh, let's turn to our poll and see what the audience thought. So uh, I'll remind you the question once again was what is needed to boost the EU's offshore wind sector and meet the bloc's 2050 climate targets. It looked like the first option uh, was, the, was the winner uh, by, by just a little bit. Uh, that's cooperation between sectors operating in maritime areas to find mutual synergies. So it looks like maritime spatial planning will will be the key issue, at least to our audience. Uh, I want to thank everyone who uh, participated today. Uh, Giles, Patrick, Minister Kurtika, Commissioner Simpson, always lovely to see you, uh, for being here and uh, for this lively discussion, which I think uh, has opened up a lot of, a lot of areas of, of interest and a lot of thoughts for our, our audience. And I also obviously want to thank our audience for following us online and sending us such interesting questions, which uh, I think also fueled a, a spirited debate here. I'd like to remind you all that our next event uh, for Political Live will be on the coming shakeup of the EU emissions trading system. Fascinating topic as well. And that's on April 20th at 4.30 p.m. Uh, and finally, I'd like to once again thank our partner, uh, PGE, for making this event possible. And you, as always, our dear audience members, please feel free to send us feedback at events at politico.eu. My name is Aitor Hernandez Morales. I thank you all for joining us. And from Brussels, I wish you a very good afternoon.